All righty, folks, this, this gentleman built a $25 million portfolio multifamily, sold it and doubled his investors' money. He's been sitting on the sidelines looking for deals, but not really finding anything. He has partnered on a couple of thousand units, but he is getting excited about boutique hotels. He's got one in the works already and is working on his next one. This, of course, is Jonathan Twomley. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Michael. Thanks for that intro. I appreciate that. Oh, of course. No, thank you for being here each week. I think people need to know just, just how amazing you are and the things that you are really doing in this business. This channel brings on experts that are doing the work. We're not posers who just read a book or a blog post. We are building portfolios. We are making decisions on real money. And you're making some decisions about boutique hotels. You and I have talked privately. Um, and, uh, you know, we may be doing something together. Uh, but talk about the one you've done and talk about this little niche you've carved out because I think you're onto something. Yeah, so uh, I I may have mentioned this before in passing on the show. I can't quite remember at this point, but I have. So last year, um, I stumbled upon a hotel for sale in upstate New York near where we have our second house. And when I say stumbled upon it, what I mean by that is, you know, I would pass this hotel every single time we drove to our house. And every time, every time we drove to our house, my family and I would say, man, it's such a shame that this junky old hotel is in this amazing location. I mean, it is a spectacular location overlooking Seneca Lake, which is one of the, the you know most beautiful lakes in upstate New York. And uh, and this place just has a commanding view. And we, you know, we would drive by and just, oh man, look at this tired old place. Like I wish somebody would do something. You were driving for dollars and you didn't even know it. I didn't even know it. And then one day I was just poking around on Crexy or LoopNet or something, just looking to see if maybe there was some small multifamily deals I could just do myself in upstate New York. You know, just because I love the area and kind of want to have more excuses to go and uh, saw that this hotel was actually for sale and it had been for sale for a year and they had just mm. cut the price and cut the price and cut the price and and nobody was biting. And I thought, well, I, I'm going to look into this. And I looked into it a bit. Then I was like, you know what? I don't know anything about hotels. Got to find somebody who does. Mm -hmm. Found my partner who's a hotel expert uh, and Found, you know, put the money together to do it. We went and 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 took the, uh, you know, took the hotel, uh, bought the hotel, and had then launched into a major re renovation uh, project, which is just wrapping up now. Mm. So here's the thing that I noticed, though, right? As I got into this, I noticed a, a few things about kind of the previous owners and how they ran the hotel, and it got me thinking a lot. So let me tell you what I found. The, the hotel was owned by the same family that built it, right? They'd owned it for 50 years, actually it owned the land for more than a hundred years. Mm -hmm. uh, and they kind of learned the hotel business by the seat of their pants, just by trial and error. Uh, they were basically stuck running the hotel the way that they ran it for the last 50 years. I and mean, they had only the slightest use of technology meaning that they were listed on places like Expedia and TripAdvisor, but they were still actually taking reservations primarily through email or over the phone, right? They wow. weren't letting people do instant booking. They mm -hmm. hadn't, they, they didn't have dynamic pricing. They just, you know, they had the summer rate, the winter rate, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. They didn't do any marketing uh, or only minimal marketing. Um, and they really kind of ran these things on a shoestring. And so, uh, the maintenance they did themselves and they didn't always do it very well. Um, they didn't put any capital into it. You know, they sort of, they renovated it one time in the nineties and then they didn't renovate it again after that. And so basically they had this asset, which was really kind of performing way, way, way lower than it should have. Yeah. And when we came in, even now we took it over in the middle of the season. So we couldn't start renovating right away. We took it over and just started implementing modern systems. Just mm -hmm. by doing that, we took the hotel through its two best revenue producing months ever. Wow. Just by running it in a more modern way, just by essentially turning on the ability for people to make reservations. Instantly. Using the internet for what it was meant for. Exactly. Well, I mean, just modernizing yeah, the technology. Social media, and, yeah. Yeah. And so, and using, and using, um, you know, really just allowing instantaneous uh, mm -hmm. reservations, right? And also right. raising roommates. And we did a little tiny bit of, of 
kind of not curb appeal. We did a little bit of, um, you know, exterior. No, no. Uh, so in the beginning in the rooms, oh, we just added, right. a, added a little bit of amenities, like things that, that were inexpensive that should have been done before new TVs, coffee makers, things like that stuff that we knew that we could use after the renovation, but that would okay. help a little bit now just with the guest experience. And um, so we we just got like so much of a bump from that before we even um you know did any renovations at all uh but we also then found that boy once we started going in there and making re doing our renovations like the the town really got behind us because we weren't the only you know my family was not the only people driving by that yeah. that hotel in that prominent going, location oh. <laughs> going gosh i wish that you know somebody would do something with this place because it's really it, it's it's such a wonderful location. So the town is really behind us. Um, so you know now we've we've officially launched. We have our restaurant ready, um, and we're we're ready to go. And as I was thinking about this, so here's what I noticed. I started thinking, well, gosh, I bet you that there are a lot of other people in exactly the same situation as this. For they sure. have owned these hotels forever, and they're running. They don't have the capital to upgrade them. They're slowly de you know, sort of de their room rates are deteriorating because the guest experience is deteriorating. They're not taking reservations online, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I started, I'm like, you know what? I, I want to go look for more of these. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, I so I found another one. We're in contract now. It's in Vermont. And it's the same exact story. Mm -hmm. It's the, the, the family that built it still owns it. They did a renovation in the 90s. They haven't done a reservation since, re renovation since you know, the guests all complained about like, say the mattresses, because the mattresses are 20 years old, yeah. right? And, Shocking. And, yeah, yeah, and so, um, and the location is terrific, right? But again, running it on a shoestring, not doing, pro doing no marketing, just, you know, surviving on the existing repeat customer base that comes there every year, despite the fact that the mattresses are terrible, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the same exact story. Right. And not taking reservations manually. Right. Because they're yeah. afraid of overbooking. Like it's it's crazy. But in both of these situations, they're afraid they're living in fear that they might double sell a room by mistake. Right. Oh, wow. So so instead they undersell, you know, by five or 10 rooms every day. Right. right? Exactly. Right. Exactly. Instead of instead of once in a while, like having to, you know, being overbooked and then having to apologize to a customer and find them another accommodation in town or whatever, right? They mm -hmm. they live in fear of that. Um, so they undersell their rooms, right? And same exact thing that summer and winter pricing, nothing dynamic, nothing based on how many rooms, you know, no revenue management, no nothing, just no professional, no professionalization at all. Uh, and so uh, I've developed this thesis now, which I think is going to be borne out that there are hundreds of these hotels, mm -hmm. right? And just in the Northeast alone, where I'm focused sure. at the moment, and that this opportunity to find these like mispriced assets that all they need is some some tender loving care and professional management, and you can really turn them into a, a high performing hotel. And the great thing is that because they're underperforming, you can buy them really cheaply, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's the thesis I'm working on. So we have the two that you know we're doing now. I've identified a third that I'm I'm kind of interested in. I haven't gone to, to tour it yet, but it fits with our model. Um, and you know what I'm really looking to do here too, just sort of the long term vision, is to actually build my own brand of hotels, right? Mm -hmm. So, and we're looking for a very specific kind of hotel, extremely well located, underperforming hotel is what we're looking for. So like, yeah, you know, like the one, the first one we did in, in Seneca Lake in New York. You know, extremely well located, underperforming hotel. The one in Vermont, the best location in town for a hotel, severely underperforming. Right, better asset than what what it's competing against, and price. You know, they're pricing the rooms lower. There's another another one I've just looked at uh, again in upstate New York. Haven't gone to see it yet, but it looks to be the same kind of thing. Great location in a great market, uh, and that's just it. Just you know, you look at the pictures online, and it's like okay you know, we got them back to 1980. Right. So, <laughs> um, and, and I yeah, think this these is, are all over the I place. think you're right? onto something. I, I think, I think in general, right. One of the people, one of my experts is a small, he does small business loans. And I think there's just a general acknowledgement that we we're getting to a point where baby boomers really need to exit. Right. That, and yeah. whether exactly. it's hotels or uh, other small businesses and, 
let's also be clear. A lot of their kids want nothing to do with it. Yes. Right. Cause they grew up with it. Saw mom and dad slave away. It's not a good memory for a lot of them. So again, <laughs> there's a lot of opportunity out there. Exactly. And, and thank you for reminding me about that point. So the baby boomer piece of this is really important and it's actually, frankly, baby boomers and even people older than that, right. Who were oh, silent who generation. Were, okay. Yes. Even some silent generation owners who are in their eighties who are still running wow. these hotels. Right. And so oh my goodness, they um, definitely want out. Yeah. And they, you know, they're ready to retire. They're tired. This is, a, this is a tough business. Um, and it's, and the kids either don't want it or they've moved away. Like they're not going to move back to, yeah. you know, Vermont, if they live in the city to take over the family business, they just, they just want it to be sold. Right. And, um, and, and there's very few people who can take over a hotel like this and, yeah. and renovate it. Right. Once you're done with the renovation, you've stabilized it. Now you've got a market of people of, you know, professional hotel owners who want to buy it but the right. appetite for for getting in the middle of that right yep. making doing the value add that's that's a much smaller number of people so the competition for these assets is really not that strong right for for the specific uh, which is something i really asset. like i hate yeah. competition yeah. oh yeah i mean yeah. so the that the ability to come in and renovate these hotels you know like that's a specialized skill set that we have mm -hmm. that I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't want to give myself too much credit. My partner is really the yeah. one who knows how to do this, right? I'm really more of the, I, my my role here is the vision, finding the assets, you know, putting the money together. He's the one who really executes on making the vision happen, renovating the hotels, getting them up and running properly. Um, but the, uh, now I sort of lost my train of thought where I was going with this. Um, you're, you're basically saying it's a team effort. That's it's a team saying. effort. Yeah. But there was something else. There was another point I was going to make about, about, uh, oh yeah. So the expertise though, that we have as a team uh, is, is I think not, not that common, right? There are a lot of yeah. people, there are a ton of people do this in the multifamily space, but not a lot of people are willing to take this on in the hotel space. I agree. And not only that, I think a lot of people are afraid of the hotel space because they, they view it rightly or wrongly as being too tied to the economy. Right now, mm. it may be more tied to the economy than, say, an apartment building. However, you really have to know what you're getting into. Right. So the stuff that suffers the most in a bad economy is the business related hotels. Right. Because the businesses right. cut are cutting that business travel. But for leisure hotels in driving locations, you may actually wind up doing better in a recession because people are not flying to Europe. They're not booking exactly. expensive vac vacations. They're doing shorter, closer, you know, cheaper which means they're driving to your drive to the, the drive to locations instead. Right. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to really be in a difficult situation uh, just because the economy gets bad. So I think that scares a lot of people off as well. And sort of proof that like the, the people who know what they're doing uh, believe in the hotel story right now is that hotels are actually the best performing asset class in the mm. world at the moment, or uh, not the wow. world. I mean, in the United States, in the right? Commercial, Every, yeah. In the commercial area. So multifamily is down by 20%, 25% since its peak. And we all know what's happened to office. Uh, the only thing that has not dropped dramatically is hotels. Hotels nice. are down like minimally, maybe one or 2% off peak pricing. Mm -hmm. And along with industrial, they're the only things that have really yeah. performed well as interest rates have, uh, have gone up. So, um, it's a great, I just think that the moment is ripe for this. And I know other people are going to jump into the space and, you know, you want to get ahead of that uh, just in the same way that I did with multifamily. Um, but I, I just, get, I have the same excitement about this and the yeah, possibility the, the, of buying undervalued assets that I had when I, when I got into multifamily before, like the wave of syndicators came in, uh, yeah. you know, a few years after. You're going to get, you're going to get a lot of copycats, but the beauty of this, just like you proved in your first doubling of your investor money is, um, you're going to be early. You're going to get most of the, the juice out of the squeeze. And then you're going to get a bunch of copycat financial engineers who will get in. My, some will get lucky. Many will get crushed. Just like we're about yeah. to talk about in episode three with a yeah. trillion dollars in refi overhang. Jonathan, where can people find you, follow you, maybe look at the deals you're talking about? Uh, where are we sending them? Yeah. Well, if you would like to join my investor list, then the best way to do that is to go uh, Google Two Bridges Asset Management, LLC, You'll find my website. You'll find the investor form there. Uh, fill it out. And then, you know, we'll be in touch with you and put you on the list. Uh, you do have to be an accredited investor, but uh, as long as you qualify, uh, there's opportunity for you to invest with us. So we look forward to talking with you.
There you go. Thank you. Yep.